Okay, so we'll begin. Thank you so much everyone for joining us today. My name is Amy Sam. I am the Health Education Project Specialist at the Maxwell and Eleanor Blum Patient Family Learning Center at Mass General Hospital. And my name is Mariam Daib. I am a health educator here at the Blum Center. Okay, so before we begin, just have a couple of things to review with you all. Just wanted to let everyone know that this session is being recorded for educational purposes. If you're interested in, in viewing the recording of today's session, you can visit our website at massjournal.org forward slash Blum hyphen center. Please note everyone is in listen only mode. This is to prevent lower any feedback so that we can hear our guest speaker today. If you have any questions, please use the chat feature located at the bottom of your screen. We'll hold the questions till the end. Um, only the Blum Center staff and guest speaker will see your question, be able to see your questions. Please do not share any medical information or personal question in the chat box. If you have any medical question, please ask your doctor. Next, I would like to introduce you all to Christina Skarbinski. She is the nurse practitioner who works for the Mass General Gastroenterology Department. Her primary concentration is in upper gastrointestinal disorders, which includes swallowing disorders in GERD, and GERD stands for gastroesophageal reflux disease. In observance of GERD Awareness Week, which was a couple of weeks ago, she is here today to give a presentation on management options for GERD. So please join me in welcoming Christina. Thank you. So I'll just share my screen here. All right, and um, you can see it, Amy? Yes, yes. All right, perfect. Thank you for um, allowing me to talk today, Amy. I appreciate it, and Maryam as well. Um, as she said, I do work for the Swallowing Heartburn and Esophageal Disease Center at Mass General, and I've been here for almost seven years doing this, um, you know, in this position. And um, I tend to do this talk every year around uh, reflux week. And which was uh, November 17th to the 23rd. So we're a couple weeks late, but better late than ne never. And it's always a very popular topic that everybody's just really interested in, especially since it's very common. So um, the objectives today is just to understand the many different um, presentations commonly seen with uh, reflux, ex explain basic pathophysiology of how reflux um, is seen in patients, understand how um, certain medications work, di dietary and lifestyle treatment approaches, and I'll explain all the different types of treatments available in regard to medications and diet and different types of things you can do that are not diet or medication related. Um, I'll identify some of the commonly associated risks with poorly treated GERD and also uh, some of the different testing message methods that you might see if you were going to see a gastroenterologist and also I'm going to touch briefly on some comical, uh, common surgical interventions. So um, I'm going to only talk about three, although it's not limited to those um, that are available for the public. So to just get started, gastroesophageal reflux disease, there are typical and atypical symptoms. Typical symptoms are the ones that you see on a common commercial where they talk about heartburn, acid, and food regurgitation, which means basically that you can feel these contents of acid or food, or even sometimes just liquid alone, you drink some water and you feel like there's some liquid into your mouth. Everything comes up into your mouth and you get that nasty taste sensation or food particles that you're like, oh, I just ate. And as well as intermittent dysphagia. Dysphagia means swallowing difficulties. So intermittent swallowing difficulties. Um, you know, atypical symptoms, those are symptoms that usually you want to make sure that it's uh, evaluated promptly before you consider it to be um, GERD. And those are cough, hoarseness, uh, voice changes, throat clearing, post-nasal drip, sore throat, and non-cardiac chest pain. So chest pain that has been ruled out as not being cardiac related. So that means a full evaluation um, by your primary care and or cardiologist. 
I put asterisks on some of these because it's really important that we don't just chalk these initially up to reflux. It's really important that we get a thorough and prompt evaluation for all of these symptoms, but especially for the ones in asterisks because we wanna make sure that we're not missing something and just saying that it's just reflux. So alarm symptoms that really uh, warrant a quick evaluation by your primary care and or gastroenterologist include new onset trouble swallowing. Patients will say, I have difficulty swallowing, things are getting stuck. It's really important that we understand that trouble swallowing doesn't necessarily mean that you have trouble just in the act of swallowing, but also things are getting stuck as you're swallowing and after you're swallowing. And that could be solids or liquids. A lot of patients will find that pills can cause um, difficulty swallowing, especially if they're large. And um, this can also be uh, discussed with your doctor or nurse practitioner or physician assistant as well. Pain with swallowing, that's always an alarm symptom. That's something that, that you know makes me want to get a prompt evaluation because anytime you have pain with swallowing, that signals that there could be some inflammation um, in your esophagus. Unexplained persistent weight loss. So if you're losing weight and you have not tried hard to you know, limit your calorie intake or exercise and you're just losing it without any um, intervention, that really should be evaluated promptly. Iron deficiency anemia, usually that is, a, um, that is caused by some type of bleeding, usually through the GI tract and that would warrant an endoscopic and colonoscopy evaluation. So that really needs to be evaluated before we just, you know, um, chalk it up to being anemic. And then also, if you're a smoker, it makes you at higher risk for esophageal cancer. And anybody who has family history of esophageal cancer and having symptoms of reflux should really see a gastroenterologist or your primary care to discuss what it needs to be done for surveillance and or diagnostic testing. So I do have this um, screen here, this picture here where I really, I'm gonna bring this up throughout the uh, presentation because I want to show you what the anatomy is because when you're talking about reflux, you really need to know what you're dealing with in terms of your organs and where things are going because we can say we have reflux, but what does that really mean? So Right here, you have your esophagus. This is what we call the swallowing tube. That's the job of the esophagus is mainly just to push food down, push liquids down. That's, that's the job, that's it. it. Has a different type of tissue, mucosa. You also have your diaphragm. That is the muscle that separates your chest cavity from your abdominal cavity um, and allows you to separate certain organs like your lungs from your stomach and your intestines. You'll see here that your stomach is generally under the diaphragm and your esophagus is above. And then you have your small intestine here. Your stomach contents is where all the acid kind of sits to allow that food can build up and, and get digested here over time in the stomach. Once this is affected, you do, so you do typically, everybody has a normal amount of reflux in a 24 hour period. However, sometimes people for various reasons, which I will go through, do have abnormal amounts of reflux um, throughout the day. And what happens here is the reflux, the acidic contents here tend to splash up into the esophagus with this sphincter, which is, I, I call it the sphincter. I sometimes call it with my patients, the door, it will become loose. Or, or open or intermittently. It's one of those, um, you know, it's a, mus it's a muscle that opens up and unfortunately can cause splash up into the esophagus. And again, there's a different type of mucosa in the esophagus. So when it has splash up, we do feel it. And sometimes if it's constant and prolonged splash up, it can lead to other medical issues. So most reflux episodes are triggered by gastric distension, which I can discuss again um, when I pull up the next picture. Um, some patients with reflux have symptoms, especially when they're laying flat on their back or when their inter-abdominal pressures are increased by lifting, bending, exercise, or pregnancy. Most uncomplicated 
uh, cases do not require further testing. However, I do encourage that if you're having persistent untreated reflux, that you do have a prompt evaluation again from your primary care and or gastroenterologist. So just to go back a little bit, I know we just looked through this, but gastric distension, what does that mean? So when food comes down the swallowing tube and into the stomach, it tends to pop into this area called the fundus. And that is where it kind of pockets and slowly allows food to drop down and get dissolved by the gastric contents. When you have food and you overeat, this area will stretch, allow that pocket to distend. Sometimes we feel super full and that can cause more acid to come back up into the esophagus and cause more damage into the esoph esophagus. That can happen with pregnancy when the baby is pushing up on the stomach. That can happen with uh, heavy lifting where we're putting more pressure into our abdominal cavities and pushing more acid into the esophagus. Laying flat by gravity, it, allow, um, it, it gives the esophagus more of an opportunity to have more acid into it. So I often tell my patients to elevate their head at night, but I'll get to that too. So approximately a third of patients have endoscopic abnormalities. And what does that mean? So erosive esophagitis, that is inflammation in the esophagus caused by reflux. Barrett's esophagus, which is a precancerous condition of the esophagus and can change the esophageal tissue in cells, um, at various degrees leading to potential cancer. Peptic stricture and Schatzky ring, scar tissue buildup from chronic exposure to reflux. Hiatal hernias are asymptomatic. Usually anything less than three centimeters is considered small. And that can also, regardless of size, be a risk factor for GERD. Although I have to say that small hiatal hernias, especially those that are sliding are very common and um, alone do not warrant a surgical repair. Abnormal reflux is designed or defined as a pH of less than four in the esophagus. So again, the esophagus is not equipped to handle an acidic environment. So when it has acid coming up, it's going to respond and might cause some damage to those tissues leading to various diagnoses. Um, and complications. So Schatzky ring is the scar tissue buildup in the esophagus. So when acid splashes up constantly, you can have scar tissue buildup here or further up. Um, Barrett's esophagus, there's the transition point from the esophageal tissue and the stomach tissue. And when that changes, you'll know that you're going into the when you're, when you're moving from the esophagus to the stomach, you'll see that transition point on an endoscopy. Sometimes when you see somebody who has Barrett's esophagus, that transition point moves up because of chronic exposure to reflux. And when you biopsy it, you can see various degrees of changes. Usually it requires just periodic maintenance of endoscopies and does not mean that you are definitively going to uh, have cancer. Although because we want to you know, monitor it, we do recommend uh, every three years and in more severe cases every year. This is a sliding hiatal hernia. I just wanted to mention what a hiatal hernia is because a lot of people say that they can feel one. So you actually can't feel your, uh, the hiatal hernia. Usually you know that you have one from an endoscopic evaluation or from imaging like a CT scan or a barium swallow. Sometimes an abdominal x-ray can show it. Um, or chest x-ray. And basically, just to kind of go back, this top part, the fundus, that can actually push up in between the diaphragm here because this area becomes weaker and the stomach will push up into the chest cavity causing this uh, part of the stomach to move up. And sometimes that can cause more reflux because again, look at all this tissue that's more, that's causing acidic contents to kind of continue in the stomach or sometimes um, it can cause uh, swallowing issues, et cetera. So what are some risk, risk factors for reflux? So obesity, again, the more um, abdominal obesity, meaning um, abdominal distension and abdominal wall fat, the more pressure you're putting on your stomach intra, in, inside the stomach area, in the abdomen, I should say. 
pregnancy again, like we talked about, uh, the child or the fetus can push up into the stomach, causing more reflux, presence of a hiatal hernia, gastroparesis or delayed stomach emptying. Just to kind of basically go through this again, as I talked about before with the mechanism of how food enters into the stomach and pushes on the, the abdominal wall and the diaphragm, um, that can, if it's prolonged and it stays there longer, it can cause more symptoms of reflux and more stomach acid to splash up into the esophagus. Connective tissue disorders, scleroderma specifically, can loosen that lower sphincter of the esophagus, causing more reflux for these patients over time. Anything, um, so things that we can definitely change um, besides losing weight, uh, cigarette smoking can weaken the lower sphincter of the esophagus, alcohol, carbonated beverages, again, by the same mechanism where uh, buildup of the gas and the bubbles can cause more distension in the stomach. High fat diet, it takes fat, fatty foods, high fiber foods longer to empty out of the stomach. It generally takes us about four hours to empty out the stomach with any given meal. So if we have something that takes longer to digest, it's going to um, raise the risk of having more reflux over time. Um, and then certain medications like um, NSAIDs like naproxen and Adafil, um, Motrin, things like that can cause more reflux symptoms, especially having um, ulcers in the stomach. So we do recommend that when you do take these, please make sure that you take them with food. So what are some treatment options available for reflux? Um, dietary and or lifestyle changes, medications, both over-the-counter and prescribed, and then surgical options. Like I said, there are a number of them out there and also being developed at this point, but we, I do have three common surgical options that I will go over as well as what makes you a better candidate for these. So, um, just moving us here. So dietary and lifestyle changes, again, low fat diet, limiting your carbonated drinks. I'll tell you, I'll be the first person to tell you, I love my soda water, but does that mean that re that's gonna be better for me long-term for reflux? Small frequent meals, the smaller the meal throughout the day, quicker stomach emptying to allow less reflux over time. Limit alcohol, or if you can, try to remove it completely. I know this is hard. I know we like to have social drinking and things like that, but know that Oftentimes when you go out and you have a few drinks, you might have reflux the next day and that's because your alcohol does pre, um, predispose or cause us to have some type of reflux at times. Um, weight loss can be helpful. I often tell my patients 15% body mass uh, of, our, of our weight can be dropped down with benefit in our reflux. Anybody who has a BMI of over 32 tends to have more reflux symptoms than somebody who has less than a BMI of 32. Quit smoking. It's never good to smoke. As you know, there are a lot of different things that can um, come from smoking and reflux is definitely one of them. And then stress reduction. A lot of patients say, you know, I, when I'm more stressed, I feel more reflux and that's because stress can cause more reflux and provoke it. So I tend to tell patients, if it bothers you, try to limit it. It's not that you know, you're know you taking uh, citrus foods or tom tomatoes, or you go into a Mexican restaurant and you're having you know, um, like a quesadilla and you're going to definitely have reflux. Everybody's body is different with how they respond to certain foods. Um, for me personally, I know that certain types of coffee or certain types of brands of, of tomato sauce can cause me to personally have reflux. So, you know, a lot of patients, the same thing. So if it bothers you, try to limit it. If you feel like you can eat them and you don't have symptoms, that's really, that's fine to eat. Again, use things in moderation, take things in moderation. Um, at night, allow at least four hours between eating and bedtime. So a lot of, again, we talked about how it takes um, four hours for your stomach to empty out. If you allow four hours between eating and bedtime, you're 
giving your stomach more of a time to empty out so that overnight you're not waking up with acidic uh, reflux symptoms. And then elevate the entire head of your bed with cinder blocks. A lot of patients will use a wedge or a pillow, but then find themselves sliding off at night with cinder blocks. If you can elevate your head um, by taking, you know, obviously with sleigh beds, you can't do this, but the top two posts of the bed, if you elevate those at night, um, you'll able, you're able to reduce the, um, reduce the, the, uh, reduce having your, yourself slide at night and having symptoms. I also try to tell patients, obviously you can't do this throughout the night because you're not thinking about it, but if you lay on your right side, you're gonna potentially have more reflux symptoms than if you lay on your left. And that's just the anatomy of how things empty and move um, in the stomach. So medications, so we have antacids, H2 blockers and PPIs. I'm sure everybody has seen the various commercials that pop up throughout the day. There are so many different medications out there that you can walk down an aisle. Sometimes I like to walk down the aisle just to see what's out there. And uh, there's a lot offered for patients. So antacids, things like calcium carbonate or Tums, Gaviscon, Caraphate. So very quick in, quick out, take very, um, you know, intermittently, not protective over time. They're usually for if you're on the go and you notice that you have a little bit of reflux, you pop a few of them and you go about your day. It does not mean that that symptom won't come back later within a couple of hours. Gaviscon, I tend to use more often, especially at night. It's my antacid of choice for my patients. I find that the liquid is more useful than the chews. Although chews, again, if you're on the go and you can't carry this big bottle with you, it's definitely worth bringing a few chews with you. But liquid I find is more soothing for the esophagus. It also puts a nice frothy foam in the top part of the esophagus to push things down at night and allow for your, your esophagus to heal. I always tell my patients to try and get the cherry or the original straight up. It, is not the best tasting medication. Some patients like it, some patients don't. There are mint related or mint flavored antacids out there, including in Gaviscon. It's really just a marketing gimmick. It's to say, oh, maybe you'll have fresh breath as well. Honestly, I think it's you're much better off using an unflavored or a cherry version so that you're not causing more reflux by adding in mint because actually mint flavored things can cause more reflux. It's unfortunate that I even have to have that discussion um, because it, they shouldn't have that on the market right now. And then um, caraphate, that's often prescription. It's usually one gram liquid or tablet form. It's useful for people who have ulcers or who have been really struggling with reflux and need something a little bit stronger to use in addition to another medication for protection of their esophagus. So again, they're not really great for chronic use. They're used more as needed and they're very intermittent and um, they're not protective over time. So H2 blockers, you'll see a lot of times on the commercials, famotidine versus ranitidine. At this point, we know ranitidine is off the market. So a lot of times people are using things like famotidine. It's a very medium reaction, medium effect. You take it, takes a couple, you know, 20, 30 minutes maybe to kick in and then it's only lasts for a few hours. And so oftentimes you'll need to take it as a twice daily medication because it can last up to 12 hours, but it works differently. It works on the histamine receptors on that stomach wall. And we don't have to time it to food. So we can take it without having to worry about, did I eat my breakfast or am I gonna eat my breakfast? And what time should I take it again, based on the next meal I'm going to have? I usually use these medications if patients really can't tolerate uh, PPIs or if they're really against certain medication treatment options. But again, I really don't use this as a way to treat really severe reflux because of the way that it acts and how quickly and how, uh, how quickly it comes in and how quickly it can come out of the body. 
So again, I have a list here. Uh, they do have over-the-counter and prescription options. Usually the prescription options are higher doses that we usually do not use in a uh, community setting just because we want to make sure that people are managed appropriately. And ranitidine, famotidine, you also sometimes see cimetidine and nizanidine. I've only actually seen nizanidine a couple of times. I don't see that very often. I tend to see more of the ranitidine and the famotidine out in the, uh, the stores. So then the proton pump inhibitors, everybody knows what these are. They're always in the news and we'll get to why uh, soon, but you have so many of them. I think, yeah, there's six of them. Omeprazole is the most common, isomeprazole, the purple pill, so to speak, lansoprazole, pantoprazole is generally prescription as is dexlansoprazole and uh, rapamprazole. These are, utilized for long-term protective treatment. So what it does is it works on the proton um, potassium, I'm sorry, the potassium pump located in the gastric cells and it inhibits the, the hydrogen secretion. So we usually try to say to people, you take it with food, meaning 30 minutes before food, not exactly with food, not, you know, I try to give my patients, everybody's human. We wanna make sure that we don't stress out over when we're taking medications because we also wanna make sure that we do take these medications. So I often tell my patients 20 to 60 minutes before a meal, it's really important that you take this acid medicine so that we're actually working at the right time to give you the best benefit of this medication. And I try to think of it as, if you take it without timing it to a meal, you're only activating a number of these receptors versus if you're taking it, uh, you know, actually the way that they should be 30 minutes or so uh, before meal, you're taking it so, so that you can activate the majority of the receptors in the stomach so that it can protect your esophagus over time. So, these can last between 24 to 72 hours. A lot of my patients too have said, oh, you know, I took one dose and I felt amazing. And while that is wonderful and I'm very happy for them, we do find that if you take them continuously the way that they are prescribed or intended, you find a better benefit over time. And those who have to come off of them or feel that or, or are able to come off of them, we tend to tell them to taper down. And again, that's because it builds up on, over time and you wanna make sure that as you taper down, your body responds to it appropriately so that you don't have a surge of reflux as a, a response if you just quit it cold turkey. So PPI is in the news. This is one of my favorite slides because it's such a hot topic. So I think it's important that we really think about why are we taking these acid suppression medications? We're taking them to prevent long-term damage of the esophagus from reflux. And usually when a gastroenterologist or your primary care prescribes them for you, it's because they're thinking about your best interest. So everybody's body is different. It, not, nothing is one size fit all. So for certain patients, I do think about the osteoporosis risk. There is nothing conclusive, nothing 100%, but if you want to be, be cautious, I tend to be cautious with those who already have a diagnosis of osteoporosis or have a high risk of osteoporosis with osteopenia or have had DEXA scans with their primary care and it really just shows that they are really um, fragile with their bones. So what I'll tell them is really follow the recommendations of their primary care. If they need to take the acid suppression, I try to make it so that they're taking the lowest amount that they possibly can, but also check their vitamin D levels either annually or whatever, every six or so months with their primary care. I also tell them if, if their primary care agrees to do weight bearing exercises and also calcium citrate. So instead of taking random calcium um, supplements over the counter, making sure that they work with their primary care, endocrinologists, et cetera, that they're taking the right 
calcium supplement, which is usually calcium citrate because it doesn't need acid to, to, um, to be absorbed or is not impaired by acid to be absorbed. So the next one is dementia. So there's actually, this is a newer uh, discussion in the community. There was a media news article where they said that there potentially could be a risk of dementia by taking acid suppressions like PPIs. And uh, or fortunately, there is nothing right now that we can say 100% correlates with these, with, with, with uh, PPIs and dementia. They looked at a study where they were saying, could that be the case? They looked at a high risk population and they saw that they were taking acid suppression medications. Usually somebody who is already of a high risk population already has high risk related comorbidities or other medical diagnoses, and they would be taking something like a PPI. They also could have been taking other medications too. And would you want to correlate those medications with dementia as well? It's, it's just, right now we just don't have the data. Drug-induced lupus, there is some evidence out there that it, and it's all, also very, very, very low um, risk that drug-induced lupus can occur with these medications. I did do a, some research a little bit on this and it, it, they said that once you stop the medications, most patients improve within four to 12 weeks. Chronic kidney disease. If you already have chronic kidney disease, we are very cautious because there is a less than 2% or very, at least a very low risk of it getting worse or anybody who doesn't have chronic kidney disease developing acute interstitial nephritis. And um, I do recommend that we do annual kidney function labs with the primary care, at least if you're on a PPI, regardless if you have kidney disease or not. But if you do have kidney disease, I try to, again, think about risk versus benefit. What are we treating here? And also trying to keep you at a low dose. C. difficile, that is a bacteria, uh, diarrhea uh, illness. and it's just going based on are we lowering the acidity so that we build up tolerance to, to certain infections. Again, pneumonia. I would also argue with acid reflux there you have the, the potential of developing a right-sided pneumonia if not treated in certain patients. So again, risk versus benefit. And then certain interactions with anticoagulants, making sure that we think about this in patients who are taking Plavix, et cetera. So what about COVID-19 and PPIs? So this is a hot topic that is out and on the scene. I do have a link here I'd like you to look at. It does describe a lot of the concerns that the population has and some of our responses for those concerns. Again, we are always thinking about this. We are COVID is one of our highest priorities right now in terms of patient, patient care. And we wanna make sure that we're taking care of our patients and we're not causing more harm than, than, than good. So key points to think about right now, research is ongoing, it's ever changing. Things can come up and then they not always the truth. And then we find that later down the line. So pro, uh, prior studies right now, they're all hypothesis generating. Nothing has been decided yet. Nothing has been correlated at all. So we have to just, all they're saying is, is should we be thinking about these things? And what they did was they looked at high risk groups, again, who are already taking PPIs because they either obese and they have reflux or they have other related issues and they have reflux. And they're saying that does the, do PPIs cause potential ability to, to have worsening COVID symptoms or can predispose us to having COVID, things like that. I don't know that we can correlate that right now. And the reason for that is, is high risk groups in general tend to have more issues with COVID-19 than those who are not. But again, something we're always thinking about. So I have this, this uh, di diagram that I, that just outline a lot of the different things that we talked about. You know, there are vitamin B12 deficiency concerns and hypomagnesemia. There are some, you know, potential in issues with with absorption, we, we just don't know the exact mechanism of them. If you're worried about it, 
this is where the primary care or your gastroenterologist really needs to monitor them regularly at, you know, with blood levels to check make, and make sure your B12 levels are normal and your magnesium levels are normal. So again, always aim for the low dose that controls your patient's symptoms. Nobody wants you to be on these high doses of any type of medication. And we wanna make sure that we treat your symptoms. So, and again, making sure that we're not just, we're, to understand, we're not just giving you medications just to give them to you. We're trying to actively prevent worsening symptoms and damage of the esophagus. So will reflux ever go away? Symptoms can resolve. And a lot of people are able to take a couple week course of these medicines and then symptoms go away. Or some people can lose weight and these symptoms can go away and they tend to feel better and they go about their lives and they don't have to worry about it again. But for some people, even if they do everything right and they work really hard, they're just going to continue to have symptoms. And this is where I say, seeing a gastroenterologist is truly key so that we can understand what truly is going on and how we can help treat you in the best possible way. So I just wanted to put this, this note here. Why does the over-the-counter bottles only say take these medications for two weeks? And the reason for this is, is because we want to make sure that you're not just treating something without knowing what you're treating. We want to make sure that you get evaluated and you get the most prompt and, and adequate care for you so that you can move forward and, and have a good life. So reflux testing. So once you see a gastroenterologist, we, we do like to meet with you, discuss your symptoms, see how we can best sort out your problem and treat you effectively. And with these diagnostic testing, it helps us guide our treatment and what, what's better for you. So a barium swallow is, is sometimes ordered, an upper endoscopy, an esophageal manometry, and a pH study. The last three are ten, tend to be ordered by a gastroenterologist, although not always, and they tend to give us a little bit more detail so that we can continue the diagnostic and treatment process. So a barium swallow. I do have a picture here. I took it off the Mass General website, and it shows that when you take some white barium contrast. We watch you swallow and watch and see how things are moving through the swallow process. And here's the esophagus here. And we watch that liquid contrast move down. And is there any hang up? Is there any splash back? Is there any issue? And then we even try, I don't have a picture of it, but we look further into the, the chest wall and the stomach to make sure that those are all the, all the structures look appropriate and there's no hang up there. So, and I also mentioned here, we look at some of some portions of the small intestine. Sometimes uh, there are barium swallows that look at the full small intestine. It depends on what your gastroenterologist is really looking for. But again, it identifies structural causes of your symptoms. So if you're having difficulty swallowing, making sure that there's nothing hanging up. It also helps better understand what the size of your hiatal hernia is. I actually really like this as a, a size measurement tool. So that allows me to understand is your hiatal hernia less than three centimeters, again, small, small, or is it larger? And then can this test show reflux? It can show backup, but it doesn't show us the true quantity of reflux and to what extent. So what is the level of reflux? Is it just splash up or is it acidic reflux? So, and again, there are other tests that can help I, uh, guide us down that route as well. Upper endoscopy, assess the type and extent of tissue damage in the esophagus here. Again, looking for Barrett's esophagus, looking for hiatal hernia, looking for any type of stricture or thickening of the esophagus, any type of cancerous lesion. So, we, we definitely, you know, we'll do biopsies and we'll take a look. Esophageal manometry, this allows us, this is a more no, uh, known in, in the tertiary care setting. So like a Mass General, Brigham setting, you'll see that we will order these for patients who we just have done all the PPI trials. We've given them all the medications and we still haven't been able to adequately treat their symptoms or they need 
testing to understand if they need a surgical intervention. So, or they're having swallowing difficulties and we need to see what's going on with the musculature of the esophagus to, to see what's going on with the, the function and how things are going through the swallow. So we use this by putting a tube through the nose. And now this is a different study, but I just wanna show you the tube through the nose and you take 10 sips of water and that's how we get that, that uh, squeeze pressure to understand how well we're swallowing with each swallow. Sometimes you'll see in the results ineffective esophageal function and that's usually from scar tissue or weakening of the esophagus from reflux or from even healthy normal individuals. So pH study options, there's multiple. It's really what we're looking for. A lot of times we like to use the two channel pulmonary impedance, but this is what it looks like again. And there's a little monitor here and it measures throughout a 24 hour period, how much reflux and to what extent is coming up in that time frame. I like to tell my patients when they go for this testing, eat the chocolate, drink the coffee, make your symptoms happen because I wanna know at your worst what is happening. And we'll tell you either to stay on the medicines that you take or come off of it, depending on how we're going to treat you or how well you respond to your treatment already. If you cannot tolerate this nasal probe, we will use something called a wireless Bravo capsule. What basically that is, is they, through an endoscopy, place a little clip on the esophagus and that measures over a 48 hour time frame how much reflux is going on. It's not as, it, it doesn't show, to, it shows do you have reflux or not, but it's not like some of these other studies like the impedance study where it shows do you have acidic versus weakly acidic versus non-acidic reflux. So what if I don't wanna take medication and I have documented reflux? Or what if I still have a lot of reflux and my endoscopy shows that I have esophageal inflammation and ulcers and things like that and I'm, I'm taking my PPI 30 minutes before breakfast, 30 minutes before dinner, I'm doing all the dietary changes, I've lost weight, What's, what gives? Well, there are surgical options. So the three I'm gonna talk about today is a fund application, the magnetic sphincter augmentation device, otherwise known as Lynx, and the transoral incision it's fund application. Again, these are ones that I commonly have uh, been in, in, in working with, but there are different ones out there that, you know, I just, I'm, I, I don't have the time right now to go through, but these are the most common. So fund application is the gold standard. It involves taking that top part of the stomach and wrapping it around the esophagus to make a, a valve change of that lower sphincter. So taking it and this is a full wrap and this is a partial wrap. So it's only going around the esophagus partially. We tend to do more partial wraps because it reduces the risk of post-operative swallowing issues. So again, criteria is important. You can't just go ahead and have a surgical intervention without being a appropriate candidate for surgery. So you have to have well-documented GERD. And what does that mean? You have inflammation in your esophagus that has been documented by an endoscopist be an endoscopy procedure and biopsies. You have no swallowing issues, food's not getting stuck, you're not having a lot of uh, scar tissue build up in your esophagus and, and just a lot of hang up. Your BMI should be ideally less than 32 so that we don't have to go back in and redo the wrap because we wanna make sure that it's a, a, a strong surgical intervention so that you feel better and it lasts for the longest possible time. Again, if you have a higher BMI, you can put more pressure on that stomach wall, causing that rat to undo. And you should be responsive to acid suppression. So in some shape or form. So I like to ask my patients, how much percent better do you feel on the omeprazole? And they'll tell me 10%, 20%, 30%. You should be somewhat responsive to acid suppression. If you have zero response to acid suppression, you're you should undergo further testing like a pH study to determine if you truly have re reflux because sometimes you can have a pH study and you actually don't have reflux. And that means that you need to be treated for your nerve ending sensitivities in your esophagus. Because over time, if you think about your esophagus, it takes a long time for your esophagus to, to, 
respond to treatment if it, and also manage the reflux by understanding that it's been treated. So, and we can talk about that in, in a bit. So generally it's laparoscopic surgery, but if you have a complication, which is very low, low, um, low chance, but still a chance, they will convert to an open surgery. After this surgery, you, you might have difficulty with burping and you will likely not be able to vomit, especially with a full wrap. So if you have flu-like symptoms, you might just feel super nauseous or you might have diarrhea and a lot of gas from below. Swallowing problems are, are complications. So again, we wanna make sure that we, we pick the right people for the surgery. Uh, surgical wrap and failure. Sometimes these wraps can come undone, especially if we're, we're vomiting after surgery or if we have gained a lot of weight after surgery. Vagal nerve injury or hypersensitivity. We can talk about that a little bit and abdominal bloating. So gas build up in the stomach over time and it can cause you to feel really uncomfortable after the surgery. And, and we usually can treat this, but we'll, we do keep it in mind. So the magnetic sphincter augmentation device is another type of surgical intervention. Again, well-documented reflux, no swallowing disorder. You, this one is a little bit different where you should not have a hiatal hernia that is less than two to three centimeters in size. I mean, sorry, you should have a hiatal hernia that is less than two to three centimeters inside, nothing larger than that. Because unfortunately you can't put this sphincter uh, device on a hiatal hernia. No prior esophageal stomach surgery at this time. You should not have an allergy to metals. And again, responsive to acid suppression means that you likely will benefit from this surgery. Obviously you'll need the testing to support that you have reflux as well. So right now we're still studying it, but the safety and effectiveness of this device with Barrett's esophagus or anybody who has severe esophageal inflammation can, uh, is not, it's, it's it, right now we're just, it's contraindicating in these patients, but we're still working on that and trying to understand if this is an appropriate treatment over time for these patients. Complication, we have had patients with this device er eroding through the esophagus and had to be removed. Post-op swallowing problems, this is a foreign device. So sometimes people are very sensitive to it being placed and feel like things are getting stuck afterwards. Hypersensitivity and it's not compatible with, uh, compatible with most MRI machines, although that again is, has changed over time and certain MRI machines or airport security, it can be utilized. So please ask your surgeon when you are considering the surgery so that they can, they usually give you a, a card to kind of look through. Just so you know, you, you know, with these, with the sensitivity component, again, you have a foreign device here. So if it's, if it's surgically placed, you're going to feel a little bit over time or some, you know, and that should go away, but some people that sensation never leaves. And that's because this tissue here, again, with any type of change in this tissue, this tissue is a different type of mucosa than the stomach tissue. So anytime this area is affected, those nerve endings even deeper in that mucosa is going to be changed. And you're going to feel things that maybe you didn't feel otherwise or that somebody else would not feel. And that's what we mean by hypersensitivity. That can happen with a device placement, that can happen with surgical intervention, that can happen with just reflux, regardless of whether or not you're treating the problem. And that, we need a gastroenterologist who's equipped to handle these situations and to treat them accordingly with different types of medications that are not necessarily acid suppression related or surgical related. So the last surgical intervention is a transoral incisionless fundoplication. This is a newer procedure. Over the last several years, we are doing this at Mass General. You place a scope, you put it into the stomach, wall and you start to clip around here, making a uh, new sphincter in, in the, uh, you know, at the esophagus uh, uh, and stomach line or transition point at the, at the sphincter area. So again, well-documented reflux, no swallowing disorder. In the criteria, the BMI can be less than 35. Again, you want this to last. So if you can get your BMI down to a 32, then we, um, we tend to find that you have a better benefit and longevity of your surgical intervention. 
hiatal hernia, less than three centimeters inside and in size and no prior stomach surgery. So postoperatively, you'll go on a liquid diet for about a week, anything that you can get through a straw. And then you'll talk to your surgeon a week later and check in and they might add either a few more days or advance you to a soft diet for additional several weeks. We ask that you do not do any heavy lifting for six to, eight to 12 weeks with anything above 10 pounds and no strenuous activities. We don't want you going to the gym, grunting and doing a lot of abdominal wall sit-ups. So clinical pearls for anti-reflux surgery, good medical response predicts good surgical response. Again, you should have some kind of benefit with taking acid suppression if you want to consider surgical intervention. If not, the likelihood of the surgery changing your symptoms and improving your symptoms is low. So anybody you know, who wants to get a surgery should have trialed some type of acid suppression and gone to benefit from it. BMI of less than 32 is the most ideal. Pre-op swallowing problems are a good predictor of post-op swallowing problems. So I do wanna say, if you're having trouble swallowing prior to considering a surgical intervention, it's really important that you tell your provider uh, about this so that you, because we want to prevent you from having any post-op swallowing issues. Nobody wants you to have swallowing problems when we're trying to treat your reflux. We don't wanna cause another issue. Post-op diet and recommendations, like we talked about, the, the liquids and then advancing to a soft diet. Can you vomit after surgery? It depends on the surgery that you're having done. If you do a full fundiplication wrap, then the likelihood of you vomiting after surgery is not gonna, it's, it's not gonna happen. So, and if it does, then that means your surgery has come undone. What if I have the flu? Well, if you have the flu, you'll probably have a lot of stomach cramping and you'll probably have a lot of diarrhea, a lot of burping or passing a lot of wind from below. Gas bloat syndrome, having that gas build up over time in your stomach and you feel bloated and distended and you might pass more wind. If that happens, you should really work with your surgeon and they can do more imaging and then help treat the issue. Sometimes that does involve, if you're having any type of gas bloat syndrome or swallowing issues after surgery, sometimes that does involve undoing the wrap and redoing it. And as time goes on, you wanna make sure that you do it the right way because over time, if you don't, if you don't do it the right way and you don't adequately get evaluated, your, your, the longevity of each surgery becomes lower and lower. And we usually don't go over two to three surgeries for this type of situation or, or for reflux. Hiatal hernia development, a lot of patients after they have a fund application might years down the line have an abdom abdominal x-ray or CT scan and they might say, be told that they have a small hiatal hernia that does happen in some of these patients and usually is not an issue. So take home messages, reflux, GERD refers to reflux of gastric contents into the esophagus and subsequently unpleasant symptoms. Lifestyle changes can improve or resolve reflux in some cases, but there are also many medication options, both over the counter and prescribed. We have to think about what we're treating with PPIs and weigh the risk versus the benefit as well as all pharmacology and medications. There are surgical interventions, but we wanna make sure that we're providing it to the right people and that the appropriate testing has been uh, leaning towards surgery being a good option for them. So just a quick thing before I end, this is the Swallowing Heartburn and Esophageal Disease Center. We have a number of providers on both our medicine and surgical teams. I do have them all listed here. They are amazing. I am the lead advanced practice provider of this center and I help coordinate between the two departments to make sure that your care is efficient and also that you're getting a lot of collaboration between both of these departments. It really has worked well for patients and patients really love it. Priyanka is one of our interventional and foregut uh, physician assistants and she's amazing and helps a lot with the interventional procedures because some of these these uh, uh, surgeries can also be done within the uh, GI interventional areas and we we often co co manage with interventional team and uh, surgical team to make sure that you get a cohesive uh, result or improved result and that's it. And this is just some references that I have 
beyond what I've already been given uh, to you guys. All right, thank you, Christina. We are approaching the end of our session. So we're gonna open up for questions and answers. If anyone has any questions to ask Christina, feel free to use the chat box. And I do see we do have a few questions that came in. So Christina, if the issue is new and intermittent, at what point do you recommend an endoscopy to see what's going on? Are there other things we can try um, before surgery? Yeah, so if it's new and intermittent, I definitely think you should always get an evaluation, especially if you're having some of those alarm symptoms that I talked about earlier that really does warrant an endoscopy for any patient, regardless of age uh, or, or you know, it's, you want to make sure that, especially with weight loss and swallowing problems, things getting stuck, you definitely want an endoscopy sooner rather than later. So I definitely recommend seeing a gastroenterologist. And what was the second question, Amy? If there are other things we can try before considering surgery. Yeah, I mean, we try to use surgery as our last option, truly. We, you know, we, we don't jump down the surgical route, route right away. We try to make sure that we optimize your medicines and make sure that we use medications at their lowest possible to treat your symptoms as well as the diet and lifestyle changes that I recommended. Mm -hmm. And do you have any holistic approaches to share? For instance, someone told me that probiotics help with GERD. Yeah, so probiotics, it's, it's definitely something that we talk about a lot and we don't really have great data for reflux on that. Uh, it's something that we're working on where we try to think about often, but in terms of holistics, I, I, I tend to think more if you're having symptoms and you're treating it with all, you know, the medicines and you've gotten adequate diagnostic testing, you can always try to work on stress reduction and things like that. When I, I often recommend things, we, we offer gut hypnotherapy at Mass General. We have some wonderful APP or nurse practitioner and PA colleagues that offer this. We also have re uh, recommended Reiki. We don't offer it here at Mass, or I, not that I, I know we offer it at Mass General, but we do recommend it as an option for stress reduction. Exercise is always good as long as you're not lifting heavy things and you're not doing excessive amount of sit-ups. Great. Um, let's see what else. And then, which is better, PPIs or H2 blockers and why? Good question. First, I want to say it, it, it depends on the person because again, what you can get the best symptom response from is what you should potentially take that being said, you also want to make sure that you're treating everything and that you've, I, and I can't stress it enough, getting the appropriate endoscopy, testing, et cetera. But I find that PPIs are the most helpful because it provides a better benefit over time and it also more protective the esophagus mucosa. Someone commented, I am taking PPI and could not sleep at all. What is the reason for that? Um, I'm not really sure to be honest with you. I've never actually heard of that before. Is, are you not, the question I guess would be, are you not sleeping because the PPI is not working or do you think it's because it's keeping you up at night in general? And I think that's something we need, really need to discuss more with the, the person who's prescribing it for you because maybe they need to change it or change to a different type of PPI or another type of medication. I think that's it for now. Why don't we give it another minute while we monitor the chat box to see if any other questions come in. Any final thoughts you'd like to share, Christina? No, I mean, all great questions. I think reflux, we hear about it so much. Um, on the commercials or if you're just talking to friends, it's very common, but we wanna make sure that we do take care of it and we don't minimize it either. And we make sure that we get the right testing and the right treatment plan that's best for us and our bodies and that we're actually treating the symptoms. Nobody wants to suffer and we wanna make sure that we can go about our lives in, in, in the best way possible. 
And do you actually mind going back to that slide with the resources, just in case anyone wants to take a peek at the resources that you're suggesting? Absolutely. Which one do we want? Um, do that I have one. These or references. The and I have these references. If you guys want more information on COVID and, you know, potential uh, with PPIs, I can go back. And anyone who is joining us today, if you're interested in getting a list of those resources, feel free to email the Blum Center at pflc at partners.org and we'd be happy to email you those list of resources that Christina shared. All right, so I think that's all that we have time for today. Want to thank everyone for joining us and more Thank you, Christina, for joining us today as well. It's very helpful. Absolutely. It's always a pleasure. I, I enjoy it. And it's a, it's an important topic. And it's always good to do it uh, around the time that it's re reflux week. So that's good. Especially important with all the holidays and all the eating going on. <laughs> Absolutely. It's kind of funny that's on the same time. <laughs> all right, everyone. I think that's it. So have a lovely rest of the day. Take care. Great. Thank you so much.